Uh, I'm starting off with, I'm going to try to start off more generally. And then I'm going to see um, <clears throat> what your questions are as I go through. Please bring up questions as I'm going because it's going to be a just general PowerPoint kind of thing. And then um, we'll, uh, we'll do actually some exercises too. So I'm going to, just by coincidence, I put this stuff first because this is really a big deal for all of you is um, how do you just get that first draft done? How do you get started? How do you get, here's some advice, okay? Have some goals. Have some goals. Write down for yourself what you want to do that day. If you just say, I want to get a paragraph written, not a paragraph about anything special, just a paragraph. Sit down and write a paragraph about your topic, about don't worry about being right or wrong or, or mechanically perfect or anything. Make it messy and sloppy and write. The only way to write is to write. And I know we're all procrastinators in writing. I don't know why, but writing is one of the worst activities uh, for, for procrastination. I think it's because it means so much. That's my theory. It just means so much it's, and that it's, we just don't want to start it. Okay, don't try to do it all in one day and write daily. So I, it says here and it says in many, many places that you will see right at the same time of the day. Okay, I will tell you that that is totally individual. Um, some people absolutely are, can do that, you know, regimented type. I personally can't. I don't know. Uh, some people can. But writing daily is, is not individual. That's something you can just make yourself do. Uh, become familiar with the conventions and jargon that are relevant to your writing project. Now that's a big thing. That's a big thing. And how do you think you will best become familiar with that? Read it. Read it. This is, uh, this is going to come up a lot. If you're not by now, read more uh, essay or articles from your profession starting now than you ever have because that way you will learn not only the jargon and the conventions like what kind of headings do they put, what kind of tone do they set, but you will also um, learn the uh, citation form because it's, it's, I found it's just so different. Yeah, I can teach APA till I'm blue in the face and they'll go to a journal that's uh, behavioral sciences and they won't be using APA. They'll use some journal style. So you have to get into that yourself. That's an independent thing. Uh, so that means read examples, um, read write, writing by your advisor, okay? This is kind of something from me to you. Um, what kind of idea generation are best for you? Somebody here, their problem was starting, just beginning, how to write. Sit down and you got this blank paper in front of you. What do I do? Okay, that goes back to the fact that it's very important too. That holds us back. but. Have you ever free wrote, free written? Has anybody in here free written, done free writes? Okay, one, two, that's all? Three, four. Okay, um, uh, maybe half of you have. Um, how about clustering? Has anybody clustered? Clustering is when you take and you, dr and you have a, a focus word that has to do with what you want to, to uh, think about. Like, like somebody give me a real seminal word in their studies, what, their, what uh, really matters. Low. Not in writing, in, in your studies. Oh. A topic, a topic word, what do you, what's your design? Assessment. Assessment, okay. Assessment, then you ask yourself immediately, what about assessment? So what about assessment? What do I think about assessment? And you don't stop and think. That's the bad part. If you stop and think too hard, you might as well not cluster. Because you write, you make a line, you make another circle. You make a line off that, you make another circle. Make a line off that, make another circle. If you ever want to know what this looks like when, when you're done with this, go into the Penn State Graduate Student, um, Penn State Graduate Student Writing, maybe it's called Workshop, I'm not sure. But if you get... Penn State graduate student, it should get you to this huge site where I took a lot of this from, but a lot of it's everywhere else too. And they have a cluster, a sample of a cluster that somebody put in there. It's a whole sheet like this and it's nothing but lines and circles and lines and circles and lines and circles. If you do that fast and you don't think about it, just keep drawing your lines, put a word about assessment. Don't think. What about assessment? 
Common Core? Or something? Common Core. What about Common Core? <coughs> Real quick. What about Common Core? Controversial. Controversial. Okay. What about controversial? Some states are, are adopting it. Some states aren't adopting it. What about that? Okay. Then you go back and you start another line. And you do the same thing. See, if you don't think, you'll, you'll come up with all kinds of things that are in your head that you don't know are up there. And that is a really good way for those of you who have trouble starting the writing, just getting something on paper. That's a really nice, messy way to start without worrying about anything. Just get just those thoughts. Sometimes I have students do this and they came up with the weirdest stuff. And by golly, if it doesn't pertain, you know, because they didn't think. They just let writing think for them. So that's one way. And a free write, free write is another way. We might be doing some free writes. I'll see how our time goes so that everybody can get a, a chance to try that. Okay, a big thing is don't expect a perfect piece of writing. You sit down, especially our mechanical engineer, don't expect it to be perfect. Write a messy piece of writing in English, probably for you, and, um, and then mine it. Look what you wrote. See what, see what came out. There's, actually, there have been a lot of research studies that show that there is some connection between actually writing and what's in here that we don't know. It's like, how do I know what I think till I see what I say? Writing has that ability. And if you just let it go, it, it actually comes. It's been tried over and over again. So don't get too blocked. Just sit down and write nonsense if you have to. Okay? Another idea is just a hint, and it works for some people, is write the introduction last. Don't start with an introduction. Start in the middle. Just put your, put your, your, put a fact down about your project. Somebody give me a fact about their project. Who's got the publications going? Teachers don't have adequate resources to teach evolution. Teachers don't have adequate resources to teach revolution. That's a thesis statement if I ever heard one. <laughs> okay, she's going to start with that fact, with that thought, and then she's going to write from that. She didn't lead herself in, she didn't set it up, she didn't worry about a reader yet. Okay, just put a fact down about your project. You can do this for class papers too, it's quite quite valuable. Okay? So those are just some hints. Now, the, ba the magic of writing, of course, is revision. It's not like speaking where you're like this and it's out and it's gone. Okay? Revision is everything. Writing is revision. So, one of the, um, or two of the big pieces of advice everybody gives who are multi-published and write more than I do, is exercise and take breaks. Okay? Read your writing out loud. That's something we don't do automatically and, I, and I'm getting into that now. It's really nice. Okay, work on your higher order concerns first. Don't worry about where the comma goes, if it's spelled correctly, if the sentence is perfect. Worry about the content, what you are thinking and what you want to tell your reader, what's important. That's important. Those are higher order concerns. Okay. And then organization will come in there and your sentence clarity will come and what's appropriate and not will come. But first get your ideas down. Evaluate your thesis. Sometimes after you've written a draft or a version of your paper, you'll go back and you'll say, hey, that isn't even what I really meant. Don't be afraid to change it. And also, another thing that's, uh, that's kind of good is writing is so personal to us and there's so many chunks that we write that come out so good and they sound so cool, right? But they don't fit in that particular paper. You, you find out in you, when you go to revise that this piece, you can't make it fit, but it's so hard to get rid of it because it's like a piece of you. So, take that piece that you can't get rid of 
and start another file, start another Word doc, and save everything. Okay, it's not a part of this paper now, but it's saved. Um, yeah, I got lots of files like that. Okay, look at each paragraph when you're revising and write out its function. What is that paragraph trying to do? We'll get into paragraphs more. This is just a general, like, tasking you when you go back after you've written a version and you go back and you're going to revise. Be sure and look at it paragraph by paragraph. You will find, probably I would think you would find, number one, that you repeated some things in different paragraphs. Number two, that you had a main point for a paragraph that you, that you brought in, that you um, developed in another paragraph. And there might be two paragraphs between them. Okay, but you'll find that when you revise. You won't find that when you're writing it the first time. It's the first time that you need to get enough material that you can revise. Okay, so think about it that way, not about this is the most perfect paper. It has to be perfect right now, so I'm not going to write anymore because it's not going to be perfect. Topic sentences and paragraphs. Topic sentences are really important because they lead the reader to, to know what that paragraph is about and they connect to your thesis. That's all they are. They don't have to be on top of the paragraph. They can be the second, third one down, but they're really important because you'd be surprised how often we write paragraphs and we bring in two or three topics into one paragraph and that doesn't work, okay? Keep a record of what you are doing that doesn't work when you're writing. That would help a lot of you because if nothing else, it's writing. You know, if you don't know how to start and you don't know what to write, write about what you don't know. Oh, I'm so upset because I wrote today a, a, a thousand words and look at what a mess it is and I, and I see that I'm rambling and I have fragments and all this kind of stuff. At least you're writing, okay? And it'll be very helpful. And don't, re don't rely on spell check. Have any of you relied on spell check and come out to find... Okay, this is writer's block. I I'm, don't know if I'll get back to this or not, but it's, uh, it's something that... Um... Another thing to do is outline. To just start writing anything, start outlining piece by piece by piece what, what something is about. Um, a bit under assessing, you could get a lot of other major headings. Do you know, um, does everybody know the rule for outlining? There are certain rules for outlining. They say that if you have, okay, outlining is a major heading, all right, and you go from general to specific to specific, right? You don't even have to do that third one. But So the major one is your major large letter or number, Roman numeral, big Roman numeral, or big A. Don't have one big A, one major heading, without having two. You have to have two of everything. You can have three, four, five, and six, but you can't have one. Does that make sense? So if you have a major heading, and then you have an A, and then you have a 1 to break down that heading into something specific, a subheading, okay? And then you have under that a little a to break down that subheading into some more specifics. Okay, now just follow me, bear with me. If you have a 1 under the A, you have to have a 2. Okay? If you have a little a under the 1, you have to have a B. You have to have at least two things to say. And actually there's been some kind of research on this and they say that uh, if you don't, then you probably shouldn't have it as a, as a um, heading or a subheading. Probably isn't, that's not where it goes. Questions? Does that make sense? There are rules for that. So, um, and it's, they're helpful. I'm not an outline person. Here's the big word that I hope will help you all and that you'll think about it all the time when you're writing. Rhetoric. Who knows what rhetoric is? Everybody has a different definition of it. Let's see what you guys think. What's rhetoric? What is rhetoric to you? How about you? Do you have a definition of rhetoric? No. Deb? Persuasion. Persuasion. Anybody else? The artful blend of fact and opinion will work. 
artful being the being the word we want. You can think of rhetoric as just about anything we do. Deb says persuasion. Well, when I do this and I talk in a certain voice and I say hello, to me that's rhetoric. And why is it rhetoric? Because it is dependent on your audience and your purpose and the context within which that communication act is taking place. Okay? If we think rhetorically all the time, then we will think of those things when we're writing our papers and our dissertations and our theses. We will think, who is my audience? See this on here? I can't, I can't tell. Do you guys have the screen? What do they do? Printouts? Yeah, okay. Okay. The ethos is what you want to establish for yourself. Okay? You should come across as an ethical, smart person. Okay? So you're establishing your ethos as part of rhetoric. Taking, in, taking charge of who you think your audience is and doing some audience analysis is part of good rhetoric. What context are you in when you're writing this? Who you writing, what are you writing it for? Will it be published? A dissertation or a thesis is a very specific context. Okay, used to be the context was whether it's technology infused or not. Now it's not. They're all, it's, everything's technology infused. But your, your, your uh, culture of your university is a context. Okay? Your relationship with your advisor is a context. So those are all things that think about. You know, I think it'll help you and make you more comfortable to think about those kinds of things rather than I just have to get this paper done in a vacuum. Okay? It's not in a vacuum. It's caught up with all kinds of things. Okay, and exigence is um, how immediate is it and how important is it? Okay, why should I be doing this at all? So what? Okay, that's all part of rhetoric. Can you see how then rhetoric is really an important concept to keep with you all the time? Okay, my doctorate is in rhetoric and composition, so I'm very, very uh, partial to this, to this stuff, but I, it's, I know it works. So think in rhetorical terms. For instance, research articles, what do they do? Okay, they contribute new knowledge to a field. Okay, they have problems to solve. They answer a so what question, why am I even bothering doing this? Okay, they might, they might fill a gap. Okay, they will have a thesis, they'll have a purpose. They'll be within the context of a science world, the world of science. But maybe not. You might have to write a research article for a pop magazine, which we'll go through pretty soon. Okay? Those are just examples of different rhetorical contexts and audiences and uh, purposes. Scientific research proposals, there's another one. This is what, this is its function. Outlines the goals, methods, and disciplinary context and significance. That's what you want to do if you're doing a research proposal. You want to convince an audience. You want to persuade an audience. And you want to show that you know what you're doing. So that last one there is ethos. Demonstrates your familiarity with relevant research. So I'm trying to fit all this rhetorical stuff into specific documents that you might be writing. Same thing with, with literature review, which we're not going to go through here, but still, it's the same thing. Who's your audience? What is the function of a lit review? How do I do it well? Okay, if you think of those t in those terms, then when you come to try to do it all perfectly, you will be much better um, prepared. This is what... I apologize for this text-laden um, slide, okay? But these are the things that you really should be thinking about when you sit down to write anything. Who are my readers? This is just one element of rhetoric, okay? Who are my readers? Why are readers going to read my writing? What do I want readers to know? What do I want them to do? How should I make it clear to them? What are their characteristics? Here's some characteristics you might have to take into consideration. The gender the occupation of this, of this reader, or these readers, 
um, what they how, what they know about your topic, how much they're a stakeholder in your topic. Okay, we're talking here the difference between writing a dissertation to an advisor and writing a journal to a um, a whole community of readers. Um, economic or educational background very important. Cultural or ethnic background, moral, political, or religious beliefs, hobbies, and activities, attitudes, attitudes towards what you're writing. Okay, what do they already know? If my topic involves specialized language to which my, my reader would be an outsider, how much of that language should I use and define? There is no right answer for this, you guys. You have to just make assumptions. When you do audience analyses, you have to make assumptions. Unless you go out and interview your audience, which I doubt will be done too often. The point is that you're thinking about these things. Um, Here's a good one. What misconceptions might my readers have of my topic? And how can I dispel those? Make a guess. And then when you go back to write it, you might actually, you know, thwart it before it happens. Make it not happen. Okay? And what will my readers do with my writing? Will they read every word or scan? All right? Some of these documents you all are writing are going to be in the form of what we call, te well, I call tech documents, but that's, that's a generic term. Sometimes you will always, uh, sometimes you will have headings for your sections. If it's an English essay, you won't, probably won't, although they're doing them there now too, okay? You can use horizontal listings in writing if, that's, if that helps. The point is that um, anything you can do to help your reader navigate through these these big pieces of writing that you're going to be doing, um, and it's within the confines of your discipline, do it. Think of the reader. They can, they can follow headings. They, are they going to read every word? Maybe your advisor is, but maybe your committee's not. You know? So make it as easy to read as possible, and that has to do with document design. That's rhetorical too, by the way. Document design is rhetorical also. How you design it makes is you have to consider audience purpose and context. Okay, <clears throat> the following excerpts are about the same topic. However, they appeared in publications with very different audiences. Here's the publications. The Journal of the American Chemical Society, a leading professional journal for chemists. Chemical and Engineering News, a journal that te reaches a broad base of scientists and engineers. Science News, a widely available magazine read by well-educated laypersons who are curious about current scientific developments. The Chronicle of Higher Education, anybody read that? That's a great, great uh, vehicle if you ever want to learn about what's happening. A weekly newspaper for university administrators and faculty and the New York Times, a national newspaper in the United States. Which publication would this one be for, do you think? You can talk to your partner and everybody come up with an, with an idea. Each light sensitive cell of the human eye responds to a particular wavelength of light. Some sense red, some green, and others blue. Yet the same chemical compound is involved in detecting each hue. A molecule called 11 CIS retinol absorbs light in every receptor cell, but the large protein molecule, molecule to which the retinol is bound determines what wavelength of light is, it best absorbs. Now, Koji Nakanishi of Columbia University and Barry Honig of the University of Illinois reported just how the protein influences retinal's light absorption. Precisely located negative charges probably on the amino acids of the proteins are responsible for color discrimination. Which vehicle is that for? Which venue? Science news. Or it could be in the Chronicle of Higher Education. Yeah. Yeah. So either one of those would be my guess too. Okay. Could be New York Times in the science section? And you said science news? Okay, anybody else? Where do you think that would be published over there in that room? In a minute. Hmm? What are the top two choices? Top two? The Journal of the American Chemical Society or Chemical and Engineering News. Okay. How about, you, how about somebody else in there? Where do you think that might be published? This excerpt. How 
All right, we'll go on and then we'll see some other ones and we'll see the differences. How and why human beings, monkeys, water, freshwater fish, and a few other animals see colors has been explained for the first time by Koji Nakanishi, an organic chemist at Columbia University. For, use, for years, scientists have known that the body gets 11 cis retinol, a light absorbing molecule that governs perception of color from fish and dark green vegetables that contain vitamin A. Once absorbed into the body, the vitamin A derivative travels to the eye's retina where it binds with one of four visual proteins. La, la, la. Where do you think that was published? Actually, they have them all in there, don't they? I, I think that we'll go, yeah, we'll go through them all, okay? This is the second one. Working with highly sensitive chemicals in a red lit laboratory at near freezing temperature, scientists at Columbia University have performed experiments enabling them to answer a hundred year old question about color vision. The new understanding of normal color perception may also point the way to future practical applications in the treatment of color blindness. Professor Koji Nakanishi, Nakanishi and his collaborators have demonstrated how a single substance called retinol can be responsible for perception of all four types of color messages, red, green, blue, and black and white. The cro Somebody else can read this one. We know what that We know where that one's from. <laughs> you can read it. Can you all see it? Yeah. What's that one from? <laughs> it's from one of the journals. Um, I don't know what the choices are, but it's an invested journal article. Sure. Which one? Do you think Chemical and Engineering News, a journal that reaches a broad base of scientists and engineers? Probably not. Yeah. Yeah. That's very specific. Mm -hmm. I would say it's the Journal of American Chemical Society because it's very specific, the audience is specific. The jargon is specific to the audience, okay? Which makes this one where I don't know these. These are these, you're, you're guessing at this. A widely available magazine read by well-educated lay, laypersons. Which one would you choose, engineer? Which which one would go in an engineering magazine? That one won. Okay, how and why human beings, monkeys, freshwater fish, and a few other animals see colors. That is pretty, that's simplifying it a lot. Where would that go? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Maybe the New York Times. Mm -hmm. New York Times or Chronicle. Okay. This one is very scientific. Your science, what do you think? Maybe yeah, I the science it's news? Science news, but looking at some of the others, I don't know, it, it, it might work for chemical and engineering news. It's, it's one of those two. I think this one would be the chemical engineering news. Mm -hmm. Number one. Because you've got well-educated layperson and there's some jargon in there. And there's some very specific um, technical ways to say things in there. Monkeys, freshwater fish, and a few other animals. Okay, I would say these, this one, and this one. Two and three would be for um, the New York Times or the, uh, the higher, the Chronicle. Okay, can you see then the difference in the audience and the context. Those are the kinds of things you want to think about because you're not, you're not going to be writing all this really highfalutin um, stuff all the time. Maybe for an engineering journal. Or, but even then, you have to look at the journal and see where it, what its readership is. Okay. Let's get down to some actual act actions um, here. What is passive voice? 
Can somebody give me another example of passive voice besides what is on the sheet there on the on the um, screen? What you want to th do is you want to have an agent in all your sentences doing something, if you possibly can. Scientists tell us all the time, oh, that wouldn't work in my magazine or my journal because we need passive voice and you don't use I. Okay? Once again, we're back to you all looking at your own, um, your own journals. However, we know that science is trying to become more readable and so is a lot of, are a lot of business and um, other industries such as law, insurance policies, and things like that. So it's okay to put a agent in, a, in doing something in a sentence. In the, second, in the first sentence, Captain Ahab's monomania drives you see what a much more a much stronger verb is drive than is previous studies demonstrate is stronger than has been demonstrated okay that's active voice if you demonstrate something avoid weak linking verbs to be verb is was, were. Okay, they substituted has here for, the, for is. Choose more precise verbs to shorten sentences. This is a good one. This study is involved in asking whether we should continue our current national economic policies. You see all that extra verbiage in there? This study interrogates our current economic policies. That's a good verb, interrogates. You could say asks about or investigates or analyzes our current economic policies. So get to the verb, is, that's really important. When you have a paragraph, as I said before, you want one topic, you want it to start usually in general, a general statement and then it goes to specifics or the other way it can go to specifics and end with the topic sentence. The point is it doesn't skip all around. Would you please read this paragraph or I'll read it and then um, see if you can fix it, so to speak. See if you can rewrite it to work with a partner and see if you can rewrite this paragraph. Soils represent major, you can even use other words because the, the one I'm going to show you where they revise it is, does use other words, but I want you to work with it too. Soils represent major sinks for metals like cadmium that are released into the environment. What are sinks for metals? Science persons. Jamie, we need to get all over this. <laughs> what are sinks for metals? You don't know? Oh, okay. Soils represent major sinks for metals like cadmium that are released into the environment. Soil does not have an infinite capacity to absorb metal contaminants and when this, compa and when this capac capacity is exhausted, environmental consequences are occurred. Okay, can you see, I'm just going to point out one thing right now. Are incurred. Okay, can you see where that's passive? Contamination of soils by cadmium and other heavy metals has become a global concern in recent years because of the increasing demands for, of society for food production, waste disposal, and a healthier environment. The main cause of cadmium contamination in soils are amendment materials, for example, municipal waste sludge, and fallout from non-ferrous metal production in power plants. Okay, a very thick paragraph that probably could be condensed and made much clearer. Why don't you give it a go? Work with somebody else if you want. I'll give you five minutes. See if you can make that into a easier to understand. First of all, you have to get the sense of what it means. What's the main point of this paragraph?
That makes sense. A repository, sinks. Everything goes in the sink. It's easy to find what this paragraph is trying to do. If you, if you read it, you can tell. Go ahead and rewrite it. Just in case anybody wants copies of this particular book too. Mm, okay, thank you. Yeah. What's the topic sentence? Cadmium contaminated soils. What's the most general statement maybe? Well, that first one's kind of general too. Okay. It seems like the second sentence is the one that's talking about the, the theme of the rest of the paragraph. Soil does not have an infinite capacity to absorb metal contaminants. Mm -hmm. I have a question about that sentence. If it does not have an inf infinite capacity, then how can you reach it? I mean, how can you exhaust it? does not have an in infinite capacity and when this capacity is exhausted. Maybe. Can you define passive voice in, your, in relation? So I read the definition on the last page, but I forget like what past participles and all that are. So can you passive is when something is done to somebody or something. And active is when something or somebody does something. Okay. Um, and are we writing active or passive? 